welcome. Boy, what a great crowd. It's great to see everybody. I don't know if we've had this many people in quite a while, but it's uh, very befitting of our wonderful speaker that we have tonight, uh, Dr. Bill Hanna. And uh, so he's got a great program. I'm, I'm Karsten Kidland, the program director, and uh, Bill was very gracious to agree to come and speak tonight. And I think we had to cancel once because of a great snowstorm. <laughs> but uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Hanna has, for many, many years, been a great student of history of the local area. He's, uh, of course, been a, a former high school teacher of history at Taunton High. And, and probably, I probably wouldn't even need to really introduce him because you all know him. But just in case there's someone new out there. Uh, so it's great to have you, Dr. Hanna. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Uh, many, many, many years ago, a thousand years ago, when I first started speaking to groups, uh, more than 40 years ago, I spoke to a group in Taunton, a women's club. It used to meet in the uh, Westfield Church. Maybe, maybe you know what that church is. And uh, one, the night that I got there to speak, I was sitting in the back. They were having a business meeting of some kind. And uh, as the meeting went on, it got time for me to be introduced. And it was clear to me that the, the president of the group had no idea who I was. <laughs> And uh, the introduction went something like, uh, here's our speaker, he, know, he needs no introduction. <laughs> so here he is. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I was supposed to speak here, I think, last February, and it snowed. Uh, it feels cold enough for me to snow tonight. <laughs> so we just barely made it, I think. I'm here to uh, speak to you about the Papas Cemetery, which is not far from here, a mile or two miles. Uh, I'm sure you know where it is. It's almost on the taunton rainham line. Those of us who live uh, in this area of taunton rainham around there, we usually, uh, I think in our lives, have driven by that place hundreds of times. I know I did. And I knew what it was. I knew that it was a Papas Cemetery, but I had really had no idea of anything beyond that. And then a lady from Rainham, Karen Callan, uh, who works at Bridgewater State, uh, put out a book of photographs. Uh, she's a, 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 an, art, an artist, graphic artist, etc. And she went up there over a couple of years, two or three or four years, and took photographs of those markers, which have no names, most of them, just numbers. She took them in all kinds of seasons. Winter, fog, rain, beautiful day, etc. And the photographs were just striking. They're beautiful. She put them out in a book. Uh, and when I saw that, it moved me to find out more about that. So I had no idea about the place except that it was a Papa Cemetery. I went to the uh, records of the cemetery department, which in Taunton they're at the recreation slash park slash cemetery office. And they had the original manuscript there. Uh, so I made a talk based on that, which I'm going to show you tonight. Now, I need to show you some slides. And for the sake of those of you who uh, would be blocked by me, I'm going to sit while I do this. But if you have questions while I'm showing these, by all means, yell it up. Uh, we'll, we'll stop the proceedings and, uh, and answer the question. So if we could put the lights out. This worked. 15 minutes ago, so. <laughs> John McKinnon is here. If it doesn't work, I can get out of the picture. Before I sit down, this is going to be a map, so I'm, uh, a photograph, so I'll show you where we are. Do you think we should shut that door? Yeah, I really do. Shut that door. <laughs> Takes this projector a minute to kick in. I'll kick out. Okay, so this is a satellite photograph of the area. This is downtown Taunton right here. Taunton Green. You can see the Taunton River running this way. This is Broadway that goes up like that. And we are interested in. This is Mayflower Hill Cemetery. Can everyone over there see? Yeah. If you can't see and you want to move your chair, by all means do that. This is 
Mayflower Hill Cemetery, and this is St. Joseph's Cemetery, Catholic Cemetery. The area that we are interested in is between those two. It's right here. Everyone see it? So uh, if we wanted to, if we had time, and I, I'm too close to do it, but we would be able to find ourselves at this moment on that photograph someplace, but that's not what we're into, so let's move. Um, That's, that, uh, let me get up again. This is the area that we're dealing with here. This is the Catholic cemetery. This is, out of the picture, the Mayflower Hill. This is the shooting club across the street. Uh, the, the graves that we're interested in are here. And you can see the rows, huh? Yes. Um, the earliest gravestone, or the early, uh, I shouldn't say gravestone, I'm going to make that mistake throughout tonight. They're not stones, they're markers, and I'll show you pictures of them. There are very, very few, I think no more than two or three, which are gravestones as you and I know them. Most of them are simple markers that are numbered. And if you go to the cemetery department in Taunton, this is what you see in the first uh, page of the uh, records. Now, believe me, you know, uh, if, you, if you've if you done any writing of history or studying of history and you go back to the old days, you really appreciate it when people have nice handwriting. <laughs> it does not stay this way, believe me. Uh, I will show you uh, later. Uh, the first grave of a person buried in this cemetery was done in 1862, and the last in 1962. So it lasted exactly 100 years. In that cemetery that you saw, there are 1,015 grave sites. However, there are more people than that buried there, because in many cases, people are stacked two and three on top of each other. So when you go by that piece of land, it's quite uh, s uh, small, but there are more than, a, I'm going to say 1,500 group people buried there. I am particularly interested in the years between 1862 and 1875, because after 1875, they began to use this graveyard for what it was intended to be, and that is uh, a, a papa's grave. But before that, it, you had different types of people in there, many of whom had very interesting stories. I was interested in the stories. One of the things that we will find here is that at least two-thirds of the people buried in this cemetery came from the Taunton State Hospital. Uh, those people, God love them, did not particularly interest me because I knew that their stories conformed to a particular type of pattern. I was interested in the people who were not from the Taunton State Hospital who were buried there. Uh, you can see that the first grave here is way up at the top, and it belongs to Emily Bradshaw. Everybody see her? Mm -hmm. Emily yeah. Bradshaw was a child. She was uh, born in this country, but her parents were immigrants from England. And I would bet you that the chances are great that they came here to work in a uh, textile mill. Um, you will notice, if you look, grave number one is Emily Bradshaw. Uh, if you look at grave number two, it's her sister. Uh, Emily Bradshaw was seven years, six months old. Grave number two is her sister, Annie, uh, who died uh, a short time after. Uh, this is common in there. Uh, you will also see, and I'll show you another picture of the grave, out of the grave book in a minute. <coughs> Uh, most of the graves, or many of the graves, are marked by these types of discs. They're aluminum. There are two types of discs in the cemetery. Discs that lie flat on the ground, made of aluminum, as this one is, and others, I'll show you a picture in a minute, which stand up. These are the newer ones, and by newer ones, I mean they were put there probably within the last 50 years or so. This is grave number 55. You'll notice that there's no name associated with that. When Karen Callan wrote her book, she also did a, uh, an article for the Bridgewater Review, which is the uh, magazine that's put out by Bridgewater State. 
And this is the uh, tablet that she used for that. If you look at the grave, uh, you can see that this is typical. Grave number 55 has no name to it. Uh, the person in that grave is five feet long and the name is unknown. That happened fairly frequently. And also you will notice if you look at this one, grave number 54, that person was removed from Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Before they began this proper cemetery in 1862, they put these people where they could. Some of them went to Mount Pleasant. Some of them went to the Plain Burial Ground on Broadway, other places. When the Papa Cemetery uh, was uh, inaugurated, they moved as many as they could down there. And by that time, their names were long gone. But you can take a look. Number 55 is five feet long, unknown. 56 is three feet long, a girl. Uh, the next one, 57, three and a half feet long. These are children, huh? Yeah. Uh, you can, you can uh, get an idea of that. Uh, we'll talk about what they died of in a few minutes. Um, you can see here that uh, this is the, uh, the first page again. If we had time, I would ask you to total up the number of children that are buried there. You know, it was very difficult to survive uh, if you were poor in this period as a child because there were any number of different diseases and conditions that would carry you off. Uh, between 1862 and 1875, there are at least 49 children under the age of 15 years buried there. Now that's a lot. Uh, out of the first 20 graves, out of those first 20 burials, 13 were children under the age of 8. You know, it, it, it tells you about, about what Taunton was like in those days, because if you look at, take, just take a look, just let your eyes go over this. Uh, I see there uh, English, I see English, I see Irish, 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 uh, and so forth. Um, this part of the cemetery, and let me also say that for a long time in that cemetery, just outside of that cemetery, in fact from 1921 to 1963, there was a whole section of the Papa Cemetery that was just devoted to children. Uh, they don't do that anymore, and I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you what they do later. Most of the graves that you see there in this cemetery, though, are not children. They're between the ages of 20 and about 45 years of age. The oldest person that I encountered was a person whose name was Dorcas Matthews, and she died in 1874 at the age of 95. Wow. Also, let me say to you that the vast majority of people who are buried in this cemetery vast majority are not from Taunton and they're not from Rainham. They're from Boston. And many of these people have been committed to the state hospital by the courts and some of them, their uh, stay in the state hospital lasted anywhere from one day before they died to 20 years before they died. Uh, let me see if I can see this now. I'll go to the next one. This is the other one is Father Downs. You can see right in the middle of the screen, Mary Williamson. Everybody see the uh, grave of Mary Williamson? Yeah. Mary Williamson died in October of 1872. And you can see there that Mary Will Williamson is, uh, her grave number is buried there. If I go to the city clerk's office and I look up Mary Williamson's death, this is her grave, 104. Many of the, uh, many of the gravestones there are hardly legible or uh, damaged in some way. Because as the earth sinks, the graves, particularly these graves with the aluminum markers, stand two or three inches above the ground. So when they cut the thing, and they cut the grass <coughs> with a lawnmower, they frequently run over these things. Uh, there will come a time when there won't be any of these things left. I think the city does the best it can, but it's a, it's a, it's a huge undertaking. 
Now, if I look, I can see Mary Williamson right here. She's right in the middle. Right here. This is from the city clerk. You can see Mary Williamson, female. Uh, let me see what I'm looking at. Uh, married. Uh, you can, uh, not unmarried, rather. You can see she was one month, four years old. And you will notice the cause of death is teething. You see that. That was a fairly common cause of death among children in the old days. Because when they, yes, teething, when they were cutting teeth and they were crying, the, the parents or a doctor would cut the gums. They had no idea in those days about infection. So very frequently, that was a source of infection which ultimately killed them. You also see, quite frequently, cause of death among children, colic. Uh, we don't think about that today, but in those days, both of those conditions could be, could be deadly. Uh, if you look underneath Mary Williamson's grave, you can see October 24th, child of John B. and Katie Coleman. Everybody see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And above that, you can see between and Katie, you can see hospital. And this child was born at the Taunton State Hospital because her mother was an inmate there, or a patient there. And she died at the Taunton State Hospital. Uh, I'm not going to get up again. I'm tired again. <laughs> now I will, I will. Uh, if I take a look, uh, the Taunton State Hospital is, and I timed this out, or did this out, is one point <laughs> six miles from the Papa Grave. Uh, and those people at the Taunton State Hospital, and this is what I found most interesting about that. that that's why I stopped at 1875. Taunton State Hospital opened in 1853 or 4, and it was built as an overflow for the patients from Worcester. Worcester was the first mentalist, state mental institution in Massachusetts. It was quickly overcrowded. And they built Taunton to handle the overflow. This coincides with a tremendous flood of immigration, mostly from Ireland. And those people who came from Ireland, being poor, being unskilled, being uneducated, had all of the social problems that you equate, that you associate with being unskilled, poor, and unemployed. Many of them were alcoholics. You know, the old Irish stereotype. They, could, they did not have enough jail space to handle these people, even close. So what they did is they put them in the state hospital. Many of the people at the Taunton State Hospital in 1855, 6, 7, 8, into the 60s were not mentally ill. They were alcoholics or they were troublemakers of some kind who could not be handled by the traditional judicial system. So that's what interested me. That's what really got me interested in. Um, if I take a look back to this, I see that she is, uh, you, you can't see this very well, that's the, that's the uh, state hospital ledger. The his History Museum uh, down here, the, the old, we, we've changed the name to the Old Colony History Museum. If you go down there, you can, they, all of the state hospital records, all of the records for the Taunton State Hospital are there. Wow. Now, if this were a better light, lighted, uh, this, were, this were a better uh, contrast, you would be able to see uh, the Williamson's names in there. But you would see that her mother also died the child's mother, Mary Williams's mother, died shortly after that. They are not buried together. Mother and child are buried 40 feet from each other. I'm going to skip over that. Um, if you take a look, this is the uh, this is the record book for 1873. <laughs> I'll show you a mystery. Uh, let me see where it is. When I went through this, you can see that this, this guy, uh, his handwriting is nothing like the first uh, that you saw there. 
fact, his handwriting is so bad. Oh yeah, here it is. I'm going to have to prop this up a little bit because I want to talk. I want to see this this particular name down here. Okay. I'm looking through these records, and I see this. <laughs> 1873, September 16th, grave, whatever, O'Neill. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then I see this. What is that? What's that say? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at this from a dozen different ways. And by this time, by the way, they have come up with a different type of system. So now you've got to decide whether he's in grave 24 or grave 124. That's not fun either. Anyway, I'm looking at this word, and I can't find this thing, thing anyplace. I'm, I, my wife is on the case. We can't figure this out. If I blow it up, see it? Anybody know what that means? Several. Seven. Now, the letters are, and this took me hours. No, 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 no. Don't try to do this. You can't. <laughs> the letters are... S-W-E-A-D. He's a Swede. He was born in Sweden. Yeah, that's what I said. So he was born in Sweden. Out of the hundred, out of the hundred and sixty-three graves that I looked at, at least. And it's, this is an this is an undercount. At least seventy of those people were foreign born. Uh, probably much higher than that. And that doesn't even begin to count the number of children with foreign-born parents. Largest numbers were Irish, but there were eight other foreign countries as well. I think that's amazing. Largest foreign groups, Irish, English, Canadians, and Scots. Now here's another one. The very first grave that you see there at the top, see July 5th, 106 next to it? And this is Joseph, and this guy, these guys who are writing these records are grave diggers. Uh, their, their responsibility is not these records. This guy is listed as Joseph 99 de Fieri. And if you look at the other side, continuing on to the right, it says Italian, underneath it says age 11 years, and then it says killed. So I'm wondering, uh, anything, anything that has to do with somebody who, who dies interestingly, or dies mysteriously, or dies in anything other than a state hospital situation, I'm interested in him. He's in grade 99. There he is. <coughs> and the best place to find out what you can about that, particularly if somebody dies in an unusual manager, manager, is to go to the Gazette. So I go to the Gazette, and right in the middle of the screen there you can see a 12-year-old Italian boy who had been playing the hop, that's a harmonica, around the city, was found on the track above the Taunton Branch Depot about noon in a dying condition. He was found right at about where Dunbar Street is today in Taunton, <coughs> up the tracks from the, what used to be the Central Depot. A freight train had just passed, and it is thought that he attempted to get upon the train. His back was broken and his hip was crushed. <coughs> the predator was called, but the boy lived but a few moments. Uh, in subsequent newspaper stories, uh, the Gazette reported that his father had come down from Boston. This kid, with his family, had emigrated to the United States from Italy, settled in Boston, and this boy, at the age of 11, had struck out on his own. He had come to Taunton. He was a well-known uh, figure around the downtown area, as well as the depot, because he played the harmonica for money. Apparently, he was homesick decided he wanted to go back to Boston, tried to jump a train, and uh, was killed doing that. The sad part of this, that's the sad part, another sad part of this story is that his father did not have enough money to bring his body back to Boston, so he remains under grave number 99 at the uh, Papa Cemetery while the rest of the family uh, are in Boston. 
I'm going to leave this. It's, it's tall, but that's okay. I'm interested here. This was a real mystery as well. Down here, the Schwambox. This was a mess. If you were to look at the Schwambox, the first thing I did was say Schwambach, German. So I looked all over for them and come to find out that there were two of them. Susanna, you see Susanna there? Yeah. Susanna was seven years old. She died of scarlet fever. Uh, Otto, <laughs> see Otto? He's right underneath yeah. Susanna. Otto died, he was 11 months when he died of cholera. He died at a time, you can see his death, can you? Yes. You can see that he died in September of, everybody see it? Yeah. He died in September of 1875. In the month that he died, 17 other Taunton children died of cholera. Now cholera is a disease that was passed primarily from people who drank impure water. I was looking and looking and looking, and I haven't given up yet, but I will guarantee you that the Schwambachs lived along the Mill River. Because the Mill River was not only in those days important for manufacturing, it was also the city's open sewer. And that's how cholera was passed. I'll guarantee you that, uh, that he was, that, that, that's how, uh, that's how he, those children died. Also, yeah, let me find it. Yes, yeah. sad. It is sad. I said to my wife, this is sad. My wife said, well, you're looking at a cemetery. What do you think? <laughs> not a... See them? Those are the Schwamlocks. Their parents, their parents are buried not in the free section of Mayflower Hill, not in the proper cemetery, Parents are buried in the uh, in the uh, other section of Mayflower, the more traditional side. Okay, I think this is interesting too. Number fifty, I won't get up. See number fifty. Can everybody see number fifty? Yeah. Charles Copeland. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at Charles Copeland, you will notice that after Charles Copeland, it says Cullen. Charles Copeland was black. One of the few black people buried in that cemetery. Now, I don't know if I have it. Let me check. This is, this is Copeland's grave, number 50. If I go to the city clerk, are you there, Copeland? Yeah. Charles Copeland. There he is. See? Charles Copeland died, by the way, in the middle of the blizzard. Sammy's right there. Uh, it tells us that Charles Copeland died of pneumonia. Now, these books, the death books in the city clerk's office, are double-paged. So this is half of what you see, okay? Let me show you the other half. This is the other half, and you can see that Charles Copeland was a barber. Sam? And you can also see that Charles Col uh, Copeland was born in Richmond, Virginia. Charles Copeland was a slave in his early life. When he was in Virginia, he was, in a, he was a slave. And he either attained his freedom before the Civil War or shortly after, and came to Taunton and set up a barbershop. There was a small but active black community in Taunton during the 18th 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And Copeland became very well known. Uh, his, we know that his funeral was well attended because he was a person who by that time had attained some degree of respect and affection uh, from the people uh, that, he, that he served. Now, if you go to that cemetery today, this is not the scene that you see. The day that I took these pictures, I was interested in this gravestone because it's one of the few real gravestones. See it? A tree had fallen on it. Um, since, uh, it's funny because I gave this talk at the Historical Society and uh, when I gave the talk at the Historical Society, the tree was still there. Three days later, the tree was gone. This is the grave 
you can't read it very well. But it's the grave of Maria Music, M-U-S-I-C-K. And Maria Music died in April of 1873. She was 18 years old. She came to Taunton from Prince Edward Island, probably, almost certainly, to work in a textile mill. She arrived at the same time that a smallpox epidemic arrived, and she wasn't in the city more than two months before she died of smallpox. Now, I think it's interesting about that because she's in a pauper cemetery. Somebody raised money to get that gravestone. And the interesting part about that is if somebody had the money to afford that gravestone for her, they also had the money to move her body if they wanted to. Which leads me to believe that the money that was raised for that gravestone was probably raised by her co-workers at whatever factory she worked in in town. I was, I was, I was, I was struck by the name Maria Music. I just thought that was a pretty name. Uh, at the age of 18, I believe, uh, thinking back, she came to Taunton to stay with her sister and her brother-in-law, but scarcely had time to, uh, to stay. Here's another. Uh, this is the grave of Mary Ann, wife of John Rolfe, born in Somersetshire, England. Uh, they spelled it incorrectly. Somersetshire is not spelled like that. There's not two M's in that. <coughs> She died August 15, 1881. She was 50 years old. It doesn't say it on her stone, but she was. She died in the Thomas State Hospital. This may have been. Uh, she was married. This may have been put up by her husband or someone, but uh, she remains in there. Now. <coughs> Look for the one I'm looking for. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, and this stuff here, they always have the, what they died of a sickness and stuff. Is there any place where they showed that they were murdered or drowned? Or, yeah. Or committed suicide? If you, if you didn't hear, yes. If you didn't hear the question, the question is do they, do they sometimes give the cause of death if it's something other than a fever or something? If it's something mysterious or whatever? Yeah. Um, I was really interested, for example, I don't have them in this, but there was a, uh, an entry for one person, it simply said, found dead. That's how they did it. I mean, they didn't go into detail. No. Uh, if you want detail, you got to go to the newspaper. <laughs> the newspaper carried it. Um, but you see that. Uh, the guy who was found dead, I looked him, I, I figured around with that, and uh, he had uh, died by the railroad tracks in East Taunton and uh, apparently had died of natural causes, but the next few days they had his family coming up to claim him. They showed where he stayed when he was in Taunton, etc. Um, there's only, as far as I know, one murderer here. Uh, murdered or murderer, just one, and we'll get to that in a second. There are two, there was some people, when, when I was doing this research, some people would say, is there anybody famous in that cemetery? Uh, yeah. There are, there are, there's one person who's famous, and we'll end with her, but let me just first. I'm going through these records in the office, and there was a reunion of sorts taking place there, because I looked at this one right here. See number 64? You can see the grave is John Dickerson. Everybody see it? Yeah. Yeah. And it says next to him, remains found on Washington Street. Forty years ago, when I first got into studying Taunton history, one of the <coughs> things which interested me, and I found it by accident, was the story not of John Dickerson, but of John Dixon, D-I-X-O-N. And I found 40 years ago that John Dixon, back in the 1780s, after the American Revolution, had been a bad man. He had come to Taunton, and he had made his living, I was going to say earned his living, but that's not true. He had made his living by breaking into houses, by stealing things, by being a general pain. And finally, after a long enough time of that, 
The people in Taunton had had it up to here with Dixon. He had broken into one house too many. He went to court, they found him guilty, and they sentenced him to death. Now in those days, breaking and entering was a capital offense. And they meant it. On the day that he was scheduled to hang, in those days, the hanging ground was in the Plain Cemetery on Broadway. You know where I am? Uh, the one that's uh, not at the root beer stand, that's Mayflower Hill, the one that's closer to the city. Elizabeth Pohl is buried there, etc. Well, that's where the hanging ground used to be. And it used to be at the far end of the cemetery uh, on the, uh, the Rainham side. Uh, they had a gallows there, which was there all the time. And the day that they were going to hang Dickerson, the jail was uh, down in the center of Taunton. In those days, if you were going to be hanged, it was a big deal. It was a, they didn't have much entertainment in those days, and it was public, <laughs> and it was something to see. They would take the prisoner, they would put him on a wagon, and he would sit, he would be seated on his own coffin. And they would drive the wagon, along with a thousand kids behind, I'm sure, and they would go up to the burial ground, and then for Dixon, Dixon was so well known and so well detested, that there was a huge crowd there. One of the uh, features of an old time hanging was they would ask the uh, condemned if he had anything to say. And Dixon, this day, had a lot to say. He gave a sermon <laughs> aimed primarily at those children who were in the crowd telling them, don't be like me, live a good life, this is what happened to you, etc., etc., etc. And after he had his t say, they hanged him. And he was buried under the gallows there. And I had seen this 40 years ago. I thought that was pretty interesting. And see him? There he is. May 20th. He's listed as Dickerson there, but in those days it was very, very, very loose. Uh, in the collection at the Historical Society is a sermon that was preached by a Rainham minister, Paris Phobes, about Dixon's life and death. Uh, Phobes had been called that day to be the chaplain at this hanging, and he had printed this sermon at the end of it. So what I found was, this is Dixon's grave, what I found was that they had found Dixon, by, uh, if you go to the Gazette, and the, toward the bottom it said exhumation. Everybody see it? Mm -hmm. While digging a cellar for a barn on the estate formerly owned by Elijah Wilbur, on the Boston Turnpike, that would be today about where, uh, you know where, um, there's, a, there's a Cumberland Farms on the corner of East Broadway, yeah. right about there. Uh, Elijah Wilbur on the Boston Turnpike yesterday, the workmen exhumed the remains of a man. From reliable information we learned that this was the spot where the old gallows stood and that the man was, uh, that a man named John Dickerson was hung there in 1796. He wasn't hung in 1796, really. Uh, he was hung earlier than that. Uh, they don't know that. For burglary in this vicinity, then a capital offense. He was buried underneath the gallows. A few of our venerable citizens can remember this incident, although 70 odd years have passed since its occurrence. That was Dixon that they dug up. And when they dug him up, they didn't let him stay there. They moved him to the, uh, to the Papa Cemetery. And that's where he is right now. Now, famous. Who's famous there? Well, there's one person who's famous there. And that is Jane Toppin. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jane Toppin. Jane Toppin was born in 1857 in Boston. She was an orphan at a very young age, and she was taken in by a family who raised her, and they treated her very, very well. Her original name was Honora Kelly. Her parents were Irish immigrants. She grows up as Jane Toppin in this house with foster adoptive parents. Uh, in her life, early enough, she wanted to become a nurse. She trained at Massachusetts General Hospital. She later became a head nurse in Cambridge. And after that, she did what many of the best nurses did. She did private duty. And she did all around the Boston area as private duty. One of the families that she worked for had a summer place uh, at the Cape, at Couture. 
And she went down there in the summer to take care of uh, uh, an elderly woman uh, who was in her charge. And while the woman was there, while they were all at the Cape, uh, the woman died. And she moved to another family shortly after that for private duty. And lo and behold, if that woman didn't die too. So this aroused the suspicion of some of the people who knew her, and they looked into her background, and they found that, in fact, Jane Toppin had not graduated from Mass General School of Nursing. She had been kicked out. And she had not had a degree in nursing of any kind, ever. Nevertheless, she was a wonderful nurse. They did more research, and at the end of this research, they came up with at least 31 people that Jane had killed as a nurse. And she became known as either Crazy Jane Toppin, that she shows up that way in the press, or as the Angel of Death, one or the other. Um, she used mor uh, morphine or poison to kill her uh, victims. She went to the Bonstable County Courthouse, which is still standing down there, and instead of being charged with murder, she was more than happy to admit to everything that she did. Uh, in fact, she said, uh, I can think of 31, but I know that there was more than that. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so that earned her a stay in the Taunton State Hospital. And she went to the Taunton State Hospital in 1902, and she stayed at the Taunton State Hospital until her death in August of 1938. That's another picture of Crazy Jane. Uh, this is the uh, Gazette uh, story from the day that she, uh, you know, agreed to say that she had done all of this. Uh, she's uh, remark uh, the most remarkable of the modern Borgias, uh, were, were, uh, renowned killers. Um, and this is the Tom Daily Gazette the day that she died. Uh, you can see at the headline is, Confessed Poisoner of Many is Dead at Taunton Hospital. This is 1938. Let me uh, say that my grandfather was a fireman in Taunton, and he went on the Taunton Fire Department in 1926. And he lived to be 92 years old. And I asked him one time about Jane Toppin, and he told me that <coughs> she at the Taunton State Hospital was just as calm and quiet as could be. She, uh, was, she was a meek, mild, by the time he knew her, elderly woman. She was a meek, mild, elderly woman who liked to set things on fire. <laughs> and she would occasionally light the place up <laughs> and when she did, the fire department would have to go up there, and my grandfather told me it took every person they had to hold her down. Because even as an elderly woman, she would go berserk at certain times uh, of whatever. And uh, he knew her a little bit, having you know, uh, been in contact with her that way. Anyway, she died in 1938 uh, as an elderly woman. If you go to the Papa's graveyard and look for her grave, you can't see it because it's unmarked. I don't know if they did that on purpose. I suspect they might have uh, to keep you know people even weirder than Jane out of the uh, out of the story. If you will look, if you will look for her, uh, she would be buried right in here someplace. Right in here. It might be that the marker, these are the, this is the old type of marker that you see there, the standing. Those just have numbers on them. It may be that hers simply fell down, I don't know, uh, but it's not to be seen there. So she is the most famous or the most infamous uh, of those people. Now, if you look, uh, the last grave was 1962 there. So the question arises, what do they do now? because there are certainly among us still people who don't have the money for uh, our family to uh, bury them. Now, here we, here we are. Now, this is, this is where we just spent the last few minutes in this area. This is the new area that they now use. It's right on the road. Uh, they no longer have a separate section for paupers. 
Instead, now they, they bury the, those people, the indigent, they bury along with people who simply buy single lots, single grave plots. So that if you go there and you look, uh, that's what you see today. I am looking toward Mayflower Hill. Uh, you can see the landfill on the right hand side there. And the graves that we have just looked at are over to my left rear. So that's where, uh, that's where the, uh, the indigent go today. Okay, so if we could have the uh, lights. Thank goodness this worked. I don't know. Anybody have any questions? Yes. A couple of different times you mentioned people coming over here that you presumed worked in the textile industry. Yeah. And I always thought of Taunton as a silver city. Oh, goodness, textiles. Many, 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 many times more people worked in textiles than worked in silver. Um, and in the early days, the reason I mentioned those people, because in the early days, uh, to work in a textile factory uh, was, was a skill. They didn't have native born people who had that skill. So they would recruit them largely from England, uh, Lancashire, England. So when you see people from Taunton in the 1830s, 40s, 50s who come from England, they're almost all textile workers. Uh, Reed and Barton started in 1824, but it wasn't until in the late 19th century that Reed and Barton came to be what you and I remember and as well as others. Uh, also, in uh, the early 20th century, Taunton was a, one of the biggest stove makers in the United States. Taunton was the largest producer of stoves east of Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, tens of thousands of stoves were exported from Taunton uh, every year. Uh, one of the things that, uh, if you're interested in history, I like to go to the birthplaces of presidents. Uh, I can't tell you the number of 19th century presidents, early 20th century presidents, birthplaces that I've been. You go into the uh, kitchen and there's a Taunton stove there. Mm -hmm. Glenwood Range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Yes? Well, I know some of the uh, records, they had a dollar amount. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the dollar amount, sometimes there's a dollar amount. Now, somebody had to pay for these graves to be dug. Uh, the dollar amount tells you whether it was the state or the town that paid for the, uh, for the, for the amount of money. Um, most of the time, it's the state because they came from the hospital. Yes. The uh, the gallows that uh, yeah. where John Dixon was hung would that have been the same place where was it the slave of the McKinstry? Yes. The name right? Yes. In 1763, uh, you know if you are familiar with Taunton, you know St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Next to St. Thomas Episcopal Church is the Parsonage, the beautiful White House on the hill. Mm -hmm. There was a gruesome murder that was committed there in 1763. A slave, there were slaves in all of the colonies before the revolution, a slave murdered the sister of the man who lived in that house. And the slave, 16 years old, after he murdered her, jumped on a horse, went to Newport. He was captured immediately, they brought him back. Robert Treat Payne, signer of the Declaration of Independence, was his lawyer. The young guy, 16 years old, he didn't know what was going on. He admitted his guilt uh, after, the, after, the, after due process. He was hanged in that same cemetery, but he was buried in Berkeley, not, not here. And would the location be where the cemetery is now? Because you mentioned the uh, Cumberland Farms. Yeah. The road, the road was the same location, right? The uh, East Broadway, the, 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 the road for East Broadway was very, very narrow in those days. And the cemetery extended a bit farther up now than, than it does now. Uh, Washington Street in those days was just a, an alleyway. They used to race horses there. It was a horse race course. Um, the, the gallows apparently moved two or three times. Well, we see only a couple of, two or three or four examples of people being executed in town. Two that I know of were executed at the uh, Plain Cemetery. That would be Dixon and uh, uh, Bristol was the name of the slave. One other guy was uh, executed. He was executed uh, on the Mill River at the corner of Court Street and Washington Street. You remember, uh, in today, they've just 
widened that road. They put a wider bridge down. Well, right on the corner in the old days, there used to be uh, a corner store, corner fruit. Uh, that complex. Well, that's where the jail used to be. Tom's Cafe. Yeah, there was a shoe. Uh, uh, Tagano had a, two sh a shoe store there. Uh, there was, I think, a business machine place or something in there. Well, that's where the original jail was. Uh, and this guy in the 1850s was executed in the backyard there. But we didn't do that very much around here. Other questions? Yes? To your knowledge, did any family members um, uh, try to find out about what happened to their... Yeah, here? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, in fact, if you go through there, a number of these people were moved. Uh, not, not any of the ones that I showed you tonight, but you can see, uh, if you look at the old records, uh, sometimes, uh, for example, if they lived in Boston, they buried them here. Uh, when the family found out, which sometimes took a long time, if they had the means and the will, they came down and got them and moved them, mm -hmm. which further confuses the records. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that happened frequently. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Thank you.